So those are the parallels I see. There have been 12 investigations of the Abu Ghraib abuses. 11 of, and they're all called independent. Hardly so because 11 of them are by generals. And I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some. And the only one that's not by a general is by uh, James Schlesinger, who was a former Secretary of Defense, who was ordered to do this by Rumsfeld. So this is his committee. And what this report says, strikingly, is psychologists have attempted to understand how and why individuals and groups who usually act humanely can sometimes act otherwise in certain circumstances. He didn't say it, but that's a looser effect. The landmark Stanford study provides a cautionary tale for all military detention operations. And he says the Stanford was benign, soldiers in wartime are hardly benign. And then the report says, here are the stresses and here's the psychological factors that were involved in Abu Ghraib. His list is identical to the one that I presented, uh, dehumanization, deindividuation. And then it goes on, and this is probably nowhere in history has social psychology ever been, in quotes, so honored in such, a, such an awful uh, situation. The potential for abusive treatment of detainees during the global war on terrorism was entirely predictable based on a fundamental understanding of the principles of social psychology, coupled with an awareness of numerous known environmental risk factors. Findings from the field of social psychology suggest that the conditions of war and the dynamics of detainee operations carry inherent risk for what? For human mistreatment and therefore must be what? Approached with great caution, careful planning and training, of which the military did none because there was a rush to war, you remember. There was not only no exit strategy, there was no planning for anything after the three weeks of shock and awe. And this is what happened afterwards. So this, this is only a small part of a whole body of social psychological research that for time's sake I'm just doing those three or four oldies but goodies. But even there you can see, in fact, we have substituted social psychology for Dr. Jekyll's chemicals and produced the same effect. That we take the chemicals out of his hand and go, look, we can create monsters. We can get good people to do evil things, not forever, because the, the cult leader, the, the con man, or the, the recruiter, just wants you to do something under their orders in a particular situation. So what I'm arguing is that the dialectic of human nature is good and evil is part of us. We're not born good or we're not born evil. We're born with a mind which has the infinite capacity to be kind or cruel, caring or selfish, uh, 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 destructive or creative, that pushes some of us to be villains and some of us to be heroes. And we're going to get to the heroes uh, in a minute. Let's now go back to the dungeon of a ground. Because now we know, we have the analytical tools, we know we have to understand the, the person, the disposition. In this case, this Chip Frederick, the guy, guy I defended. Uh, uh, we have to understand the physical place. We have to understand mostly the the social, psychological setting, the behavioral context, and we have to know what was the system that created that dungeon, that situation. So who's, he, he's an Army Reserve MP in charge of the night shift. He's one of the bad apples. We're going to say, what was he like before he went there? What was he like after he went there? What, what was the situational influence on him while he was there? So I said, I take on the role of investigator reporter to find out everything I could about him and become an expert witness on his trial. I give the situational defense, and the army gives the dispositional uh, uh, prosecution. So here he is. The, the guy you saw in, in those scenes is a prisoner called Shit Man. He, he was mentally ill. He covered himself with his own shit every day. And Chip Frederick would roll him in dirt just to, not, to have it, not to have it stink. Uh, and then here's a picture of, of him sitting, sitting on the prison between two gurneys, between uh, stretchers. They did this just to get him to stop doing this because everybody's going crazy, the prisoners and guards. He makes a mistake of sitting on him because somebody said, hey, Chip, sit on him. I want to take a picture. But this is one of the bad things he did. He and one of those beautiful women you saw said, hey, let's do something interesting. Let's get the guy on the box. To, we'll put uh, fake electrodes on and we'll tell him if he falls off the box, he's going to get electrocuted. They didn't think anything was wrong because it was fake, except he didn't know it. Putting prisoners in a stress position was one of eight um, uh, Rumsfeld um, uh, statements about how you, what, what soldiers should do, what interrogators should do to get confessions. In the book, I have what those eight uh, are, and I'll talk about some of them. The worst thing he did physically is he punched a, he punched a detainee once in his chest who was escaping. 
And we're going to see that's nothing compared to the fact that 21 prisoners were, have been murdered in, in all of our military prisons by the, by the military assessment. So I know, what was he like before going down that dungeon? He is the most patriotic young man I have ever met. He loves his country. He loves the American flag. He takes pictures of him with the American flag. He gives the American flag as gifts. You know, people go, you know, one, one is enough. He gives people, he tears up. He tears up when they play the Star Spangled Banner. Even after he was in prison, which is, you know, foreshadowing the result, he said, I'm still willing to die for my country. He was, he was um, before he was in Army Reserve, he was in National Guard for, for, for uh, uh, 22 years. What is his disposition? I have him tested by the Army clinical psychologist. I have his, that assessment uh, checked by uh, uh, another psychologist, friend of mine, who didn't know that it was Chip Frederick. And then I interviewed him, tested, gave him other tests at home. What did the test say? Normal. On every measure, this guy is normal. Between the 40th and 60th percentile, in every single personality measure on the MMPI, on, on several other measures. Not a single evidence of sadistic, uh, a sadistic personality. I won't go through it, but this is the most all-American guy. For, you know, his father's a, it's a, it's a cartoon. His father's a West Virginia coal mine. He's a Baptist. He goes to church. He plays softball. He hunts. He fishes. He's got a lot of friends, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's like a normal Ro Norman Rockwell picture with, with an American flag. Uh, he's in model Army Reservist. He's got nine medals and awards. Not only that, I check, I check his prison rec. He was a guard in a small prison in, in Pennsylvania. I get his annual reports. Every report, he's getting better and better. But he's in charge of 10 or 20 prisoners in a small, low-security prison. Super patriot until he goes to the dungeon. What was the situation like? All the things that were in the Stanford prison study are there. In, in all the reports, I don't, aside from him, I have a woman who's in charge of the investigation, Marcy Drury, who actually gives an endorsement of the book, telling me about what it was like. It's identical to prison study, and all the worst abuses were on the night shift because there was no surveillance. There was no supervision in both places. He worked 12-hour shifts, 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., seven days a week for 40 days without a day off. And they gave him one day off, and he worked two more weeks. So he worked, he worked 60 days with one day off. What were the conditions like? It was incredible. It was filthy. Toilets were overflowing. There's shit all over. There's rats running all over. Uh, the prisoners are naked. There's, no, there's not enough showers. Everybody, the prisoners stink. Everybody stinks. The soldiers stink. Uh, uh, 